Hello and welcome to Book to Read D, it's for diaries. I'm planning to present 10 of the world's greatest diaries in date order. In this episode I present the next two. Chips Channon, who lived from 1897 to 1958, and Victor Klemperer, who lived from 1881 to 1960. The first is Sir Henry Channon nicknamed Chips. He arrived in Europe from America in 1918, aged 21, the only child of a Chicago businessman. Oozing charm, ability and ambition, he rose rapidly in high society. He married Lady Honor Guinness became a Member of Parliament and served at the Foreign Office from 1938 to 1941. From his late twenties, he was a ubiquitous figure in London society. His friends included King Edward VIII, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and Lady Cunard. His diaries, especially those covering the years 1934 to 1952, are wonderfully indiscreet. Here is his entry for the 20th of February 1934. Am I wise to embrace a parliamentary career? Can I face the continued strain? James Willoughby told me that he nearly gave up his parliamentary campaign in November as he just could not stand the ordeal of speaking. When he confessed this to his agent, the man replied, Don't let not speaking well dishearten you. I have, I have known candidates who could not even read. Here is his entry for the 26th of July 1934. I feel caddish, even treacherous keeping this diary from the eyes of my wife, yet it is our only secret. She knows I keep it, but if she were to read it, and I knew she were, it would lose much spontaneity and cease to be a record of my private thoughts. Once or twice in the past, I have dictated a few harmless paragraphs to a secretary, and they have never been the same, becoming impersonal and discreet immediately. And what is more dull than a discreet diary? One might as well have a discreet soul. Here is his entry for the 7th of March, 1934. My 35th birthday. Actually, I have lied so much about my age that I forget how old I really am. I think I look 28, and no, I feel 19. And here is his entry for the 19th of June, 1938. The Sunday Express today published a most extraordinary paragraph to the effect that I am really 41 instead of 39, and hinted that I had faked my age in the reference books. The awful thing is that it is true. Now I feel apprehensive and shy, as one does when one is in disgrace. Honour is being very sweet and loyal about it. I told her that she would be a widow two years earlier. The Battle of Britain had begun on the 10th of July 1940. Here is his entry for the 15th of July 1940. What can the future hold for us personally now? What can one look for only to save from the wreckage one's hopes, one's possessions and some part of one's fortune? What a mess! I have little heart to go on. Aqua bon, what's the point? All I want is an oval library with doors leading into a rose garden by the sea. Here is his entry for the 25th of August 1940. The newspapers and the fish were both late in arriving as a bomb fell on the Epping on the road last night and there are tales of raids everywhere, particularly in Kent and two over the London area. I am burying another tin box containing my diaries for the first year of the war. Mortimer the gardener is again my accomplice. And here is his entry for the 31st of August 1944. The Allies march on to victory. More triumphs everywhere. 
what a fortnight it has been. Key towns of which one has never heard fall daily, and Paris has been liberated twice in three days. However, it wasn't until May 1945 that Germany surrendered unconditionally. The second diarist is Victor Klemperer. His war diaries span the period 1933 to 1945. Victor Klemperer was the son of a rabbi. He studied in Munich, Geneva, Paris and Berlin, where he became a journalist. He taught at the University of Naples and received the Distinguished Service Medal as a volunteer in the German Army in the First World War. Subsequently, he was Professor of Romantic Languages at Dresden Technical College until he was dismissed as a consequence of Nazi laws in 1935. He survived the Holocaust and the war and taught as an academic in East Germany until his death. His diaries, 1933 to 1945, are a graphic portrayal of life under Nazi rule. Here is his entry for the 12th of February, 1941. Hopeful, although threatened by catastrophe. Charge, because room not blacked out. That can mean a fine of so many hundred marks that I'm forced to sell the house. It can also be disposed of with 20 marks. There are examples of both. I assumed the worst for a whole day. I'm calmer now. It was truly a misfortune. Liability through negligence. We are usually both extremely careful with regard to the blackout. Against the night sky, once the light has been switched on, it is impossible to tell whether the shutters have been closed. When the policeman rang the doorbell at nine, we were quite unsuspecting. We led him to the window so that he could see for himself that it was blacked out. The man was courteous and sympathetic. He, he had to charge me because neighbours had reported the light. I had to state income and property. After the chief of police will determine the level of the penalty. Until yesterday, I was only expecting the worst. Yesterday, Frovas told me of a case in which someone had only paid 12 marks. Admittedly, the someone was the Aryan wife of a general and I have a J on my identity card. Now I must wait, my mood going up and down. Here is his entry for the 1st of March, 1941. In the morning, the milkmaid refused to come up. She is no longer allowed to deliver to Jews' houses. At midday at the bank, only 178 marks had been transferred from the, from the pension office instead of the 409 marks of previous months, the new social deduction from Jews, 15% of income, deducted all at once for the three months January to March. After that, the butcher declared he would have to give less from now on because deliveries were so poor. Here is his entry for the 18th of September, 1941. The Jewish star, black on yellow cloth, at the centre in Hebrew-like lettering, Jew, to be worn on the left breast, large as the palm of a hand, issued to us yesterday for ten phoenix, to be worn from tomorrow. The omnibus may no longer be used, only the front platform of the train. For the time being, at least, Eva, his Aryan wife, will take over all the shopping. I shall breathe in a little fresh air under shock of darkness. Here is his entry for the 22nd of September 1941. Yesterday shot in all day in glorious weather. In the evening sneaked out for a couple of minutes. Every step, the thought of every step is desperation. Lissy Mayhoff writes from Berlin, passes by sympathised with the star wearers. Here is his entry for the 1st of November 1941. Was for the first time subjected to some abuse the day before yesterday. At Chemnitzer Plaza, a section of Hitler youth cubs, a yid, a yid, yelling, they run towards the dairy I'm just entering. I can still hear them shouting and laughing outside. When I come out, they are lined up. I look calmly at their commander, 
not a word spoken. Once I am past, behind me, but not called out loudly, one, two voices, a yid. Here is his entry for the 22nd of December 1941. Decrees yesterday. One, prohibition on using public telephones. Two, curfew for all Jews from the morning of December the 4th to January the 1st. Since provocative behaviour of a Jew in public has caused outrage. The one outrageous case is supposed to have been this. A Nazi cat shouts at an elderly gentleman, Get down off the sidewalk, Jew. He refuses. He has a right to be on the sidewalk. He is summoned to the Gestapo for questioning and imprisoned. And now here's a quick recap and I'll be back soon with another Fortune video.